ان جعلنا ما على الارض زينه لها لنبلوهم ايهم احسن عملا very very beautiful ayah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah which is the seventh ayah of surah al-kahf he gives us an insight into the reality of this life and how the reality of this dunya is in relation to our existence on this earth and our purpose and what's very interesting to know is brothers and sisters is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off with the particle inna now inna in arabic there's no translation for it in the english language it's a particle of emphasis Right if I was to try giving you a brief just get across the meaning to you of what Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here Allah is saying inna which translates as if you like without a shadow of a doubt absolutely certainly there's no doubt in it it's a fact and you also keep in mind that when Allah speaks whatever Allah says is a fact whatever Allah says is true there's no doubt in it but when Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath on top of what he says then we really have to pay attention We really have to pay attention. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says here, after saying Inna, He says, whatever He has made, whatever He has made on the surface of this earth, upon this earth, He's made it a zina, a beautification, an adornment. Now, adornment, you guys may be thinking, what does adornment mean? Right? Let's sim- break it down into simple English. Adornment meaning a beautification, a decoration, something that's pleasing to look at, something that's luring, something that looks stunning. Allah has made everything on the surface of this earth a beautification for it. And then Allah says because for the reason to test us to see which of us are the best in action. So here Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala is linking our test which is to see who are the best in action, who are the best in deeds to the beautification of this dunya. So in other words one way to look at this is that we will be tested through this dunya. We will be tested with the things in this dunya. Now brothers and sisters we have two choices when we really think about this. There's two ways we can go. There's two directions we can take. Either one, we understand the reality of this life. We understand that this dunya has been made beautiful. We're here to be tested. We understand that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala created us for a very distinct and clear purpose which is to worship Allah. And then in this life we navigate through this life by using the dunya to lead us to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. That's one way. That's one thing we can do. We can use all the faculties Allah has blessed us with, the ability to reason and understand and to reflect and to contemplate and understand the reality of this dunya and use the dunya to lead us to Allah and to his worship. Or we can fall head over heels into this dunya and lose ourselves. We can make the dunya the objective, the world. When I say dunya I mean the worldly life the objective, and we can completely lose ourselves in it. These are the real two choices we have to make in this life. And Allah gave us free choice. He gave us free will. And this is the reality here. We have to choose between these two states. What do we do in this life? Because it's not going to last. It's going to come to an end. What's your life about? What defines you? What are you all about, right? So when we look at materialism from this perspective, the idea is that everything we focus on in life should be about the material world. Everything we do should be about gaining more material wealth, earning more money. you know buying more things having nicer clothes the materialism the ideology is that it's all about the physical keep buying keep having just keep desiring keep wanting as much material things as you want it's all about acquiring material wealth and running after it and desiring it so again it's all about the material if you look at the philosophy such as ideologies or world views such as atheism again what's it about there is no god there is no creator all that exists is this physical life this physical world you're going to live once and you're going to die and it's all over yolo you only live once do what you want right that's the type of idea. again it's all about the physical and material disconnected from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Look at our schooling systems. They're very secular in nature. God is removed from education completely. Take science, the underlying philosophy of science. It's called the methodological naturalism, something that science depends upon, which is big term. What it basically means is that science is based on a premise which is that we only deal with the physical world. We're not denying God, but we're not proving God. We're not interested in the question of God. Let's just study the physical world. Let's just study the physical world. Again, it's all about the physical. right naturalism atheists say well, there is no god there is no creator it's all you know it's just an accident a naturalist would say there is no god there is no creator there is nothing beyond the physical it's all physical everything we see in the world today whether it be the trees the sun the moon all of these things in the natural world is all a result of physical processes there's nothing beyond this again all physical every angle we look at the world we live in today it's promoting the physical it's promoting the dunya that's what the focus is on and this is the world that we live in and especially for the youth the youngsters our young brothers and sisters muslim even non muslim youth this is the world we're growing up in that's just purely focused on the material purely focused on the material 
And then we, we, all, we wonder why we're having issues, you know, why we have problems in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why, why our youth are turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why non-Muslims are just not interested in religion. They're just not interested in Islam. They're not interested in the question of God. All they're concerned about is what? The dunya, the material world. Like we defined already, materialism, like we said, it's the idea that everything we should be focused on, our mind is just consumed and our hearts are just consumed by what's around us, the physical world. That's all we're here to engage with. Wanting to buy more things, having material goals. I want to buy a house in 10 years time. I want to have my own property. I want to have a nice car. I want to have this. I want to have that. And that's all we get caught up in. And to promote this, you know, it's not just what we are desiring, but this, the system is set in a way to promote this ideology. Black Friday comes around, what happens? People go crazy. You've seen the videos online on, on BBC and see, you see on news channels, people go crazy. They're running over each other. They just want to push everyone out the way. And it's like they're, it's like they're doing Hajj or something. Yeah, it's fun. Like if you think about it, it's crazy, right? The, the, people just want to, they're just so fixated on getting a good deal and having more material possessions. Now you have Cyber Mondays as well, for example, online. Again, all just fixated on the material, you know, and, and materialism and by extension now consumerism and the difference between the way I see the difference between these two things, just to define terms here, materialism is the internal state, if you want to see it that way, the internal state of a person who is fixated and consumed by the material world. He just wants to keep buying, keep amassing wealth, keep amassing things, keep gaining material things, keep buying different things, left, right and center, just keep, consu just keep, keep collecting these things, right? Consumerism is now that materialist state in action. Now you go and you go buy and you keep buying and you keep buying and you keep buying and, and it almost becomes a, a mental disorder in a way. Because some people, it's a, it's a recorded phenomenon, some people, it's a disorder for them. They can't help but buy things anymore. They just can't help it. They want, they're compelled, they need to go buy something. If they don't, they get depressed, they get anxious, they get frustrated. So these, and th this has been promoted, this has been pushed by the system that we live in, right? And it's unfortunate because what's happening with all of this is that the people that are pulling the strings up above, the elite few, they're just getting richer and we are just like pawns in the system. We're just slaves, just doing what they want us to do to fill their pockets. Really amazing stats, brothers, and really pay attention to this and really think about this for a second. Eight people, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can count on your fingers. Eight people in the world have more wealth than 50% of the world's population. Just think about that for a second. Eight people in the world have more wealth than 3.6 billion people on the face of this earth. Where's the justice there? What's going on? And how is this happening? It's through this entire system. You know, it's, it's modern day slavery if you really think about it, brothers and sisters. Well, like nine to five, Monday to Friday, we go into the cities, we go into our jobs, we go into our businesses, we do our thing, we press a few buttons, we do what, we, what they want us to do. Come Friday, you start getting fed up. What do they do? Saturday and Sunday, take it off. What do non-Muslims normally end up doing on Saturday and Sunday? For a lack of a better term, yeah, better words. They go get smashed, they get drunk, they go do whatever they want, escapism. Just go get drunk, forget about it, relax, enjoy yourself, go spend the money that you worked so hard to earn, put it back into the system and come back Monday morning to repeat the cycle over again. This is the system that we're stuck in, right? This is the reality and, and this is a very, it's very interesting because this has not just happened by accident. It's a deliberate process that's been put into place. In the 50s, for example, this, the, the principles were really put into place regarding consumerism. For example, there was this whole idea of perceived and planned obsolescence. What is this? Products and things were being designed with the intention that they will break down after a few years. Deliberately, that was a part of the design process that the products will break down. Why? So then the person that buys them, he'll go buy a new product after a couple of years. And then this was balanced out with perceived obsolescence, which is that, oh, if we keep, if our products keep breaking down, people are going to start clocking on, something's wrong, something's not adding up here, you know? And we've noticed this, you know, you've probably heard your parents say, the, the way they make fridge freezers these days is not the way that they used to make them 30, 40 years ago, right? Things used to last back in the day. Now they seem to just break down. So they thought, okay, if we keep, things keep breaking down, people are going to start working out something's going on here. So perceived obsolescence. What's perceived obsolescence? We create this narrative in society that after every couple of years, things go out of fashion. And the youth can relate to this. Things aren't cool anymore. They're not trendy anymore. Who's got an iPhone here? What happens every year? There's a new phone, yeah? iPhone X, XS, God knows which other ones, right? And what happens? Our phones are working fine. Yeah, our phones are working fine, but we want the new phone because our old phone's gone out of fashion now. It's not in trend anymore. You know, we want to buy that. So these both, is, the system's been put into place to get us to just be fixated on this consumer society. Just be fixated on this and to compete with each other, to outdo each other. And we're just falling into this trap, head over heels. 
102nd chapter of the, of the Quran. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Look at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he says. Al-Hakum al-Takathur hatta zurtum al-Makabir. Al-Hakum refers to when a human being engages in something, is fixated on something, is focused on something, which distracts him from things which are more important. Okay, so where a human being is fixated on something, which is making him heedless, is distracting him from the things that are more important. Al-Takathur, Kathara, it means increase, an increase of something. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves it open. He doesn't say an increase in what? Therefore the scholar said that this is general, it's broad. It could be an increase in everything and anything. So at takathur here is referring to a few things. Two things that are very important I want to point out. Number one is just being, just wanting to gain more and more of the dunya, of the worldly life. More wealth, more material things. Just constantly being wanting to acquire more things. And secondly, competing with each other to outdo each other to gain these things. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al-hakum at takathur, Allah is saying that this competition with each other and this fixation on trying to gain as much as you can of this dunya is distracting you, is deluding you, is making you heedless of the things which are much more important. Which is what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The purpose of our life, the reason we were created. What are we here to do? This fixation on the dunya, and it applies to us today as much as it did in throughout history. This fixation on gaining the material world, running after the dunya is distracting us, is putting us to sleep in regards to the reason we were created. The true reality of life. The real reason we're here for, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we, we've forgotten about this, subhanAllah. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is why it's very important to have that relationship with the Quran. And this materialism, this consumerism is on many levels, brothers. Wallahi, many levels. Especially in the times we live in. You may not think this. Who has Facebook? Instagram? Okay, YouTube? Okay, what do we do on these social media platforms? We fall into one or two groups. Either you're a content creator or you're a consumer. Content creators make content. What are they doing? They're always looking at how many views do I have? How many subscribers am I gaining? Are people watching my videos? What are the comments they're leaving? Do they like the stuff I'm putting out? We're consuming people's opinions. This is a digital form of consumerism and materialism. Those that just don't, those are just browse. What are we doing? We're consuming the content on our feeds. What people are putting out. Especially the young brothers and sisters. How much time do we spend on social media? If we're honest with ourselves. How many times have you found yourself in this position? Time for Asr. You're browsing through, you're writing some comments, you're engaging with someone on social media. Ah, oh, give me 10 moments. 10, 15 minutes, I'll go do wudu and I'll go pray. Before you know it, there's 10 minutes of Maghrib left. And then you get up, oh my God, I'll, you know, just quickly get up, quickly do wudu, bounce your head off the ground a few times, think you're doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a favor. And then you go back to what you're doing. And then we worry, we think, why is our salah lacking? Why can't I connect with Allah? You know, Iqbal, poet from Pakistan, from the past, he said something very powerful, and I'm paraphrasing his words. He said something along the lines of, he said, whenever I put my head down in prostration, when my head meets the ground, a voice comes from the ground and it tells me, what are you going to find in this prostration when your heart is occupied with the world, with the dunya? If your heart is consumed by dunya, worldly affairs, just consuming just the world around you, whether it be in the form of the digital media, whether it be in the form of just amassing wealth, how are we ever going to have space in our hearts for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are we going to find that space? Is our eye questioned, oh I can't connect with Allah, is that even justified when we really think about our states? You know subhanAllah, we don't, we need to think about this brothers wallahi and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the Quran as the kitab, the book, we gave ourselves Facebook. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we gave ourselves Justin Bieber and Britney Spears and God knows who else is famous these days, yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He honored us. He gave us our identity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created Adam, what did He say to the angels? I'm going to create a vice on earth, a representative. Look at the way Allah honored us, the human being. Allah defined us by this and we define ourselves by our shoes and the clothes that we wear. Look at the injustice that we're doing just, just to ourselves. Look at what Allah told us we are and look at how we are defining ourselves. It's such a sad reality, brothers. We're like young brothers and sisters, we define ourselves by the shoes that we wear or the clothes that we wear or the way our hair's cut, you know, or the watch that we're wearing or the car that you're driving. What's wrong with us? Is this all that we've become, our lives have become about? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. We really need to check ourselves because as long as we're plugged into this dunya and the way we are, we're never going to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're never going to find room in our hearts. And we're never going to experience the truth of Islam like we should be experiencing it. So we need to really check ourselves. This doesn't mean throw the dunya away. I'm not saying that. But use it in the right way. Use it in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to use it, brothers. Wallahi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kahf, from the 32nd ayah to the 44th ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares the story of the two gardens. And I'm going to just narrate the story to you, just so we can really appreciate it and understand it. Two guys are good friends. They're walking along a path one day, wherever they're walking. They both have gardens. One of them is really wealthy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with a lot of wealth. 
he has two gardens. And I just check, just visualize his garden for a second to put this into perspective. And then you can correlate that to what that may mean in wealth from today's perspective. He has two huge gardens. In the center of his gardens, he has grapevines, you know, prized fruit. Around the gardens, he has date palms. Not only do they bear fruit, but they also protect the, the delicate grape wines in the middle. He has gushing streams and rivers within his gardens. Between his two gardens, he has other crops. So he's loaded, yeah? he's got a lot of wealth. Now, as he's walking with his friend one day, he says to him, he says, as they're speaking, he just throws it in there. He says, you know what? I'm greater than you, I have more than you. This competition, I have more than you. I have more wealth, I have more manpower. I have much more wealth, you're better off than you. you know? And he walks into his garden and as he's looking around, he says, I don't think this is gonna go anywhere. I don't think the hour is ever going to come. And even if I'm brought back to my Creator, even if Allah brings me back to Him at the end of the Day of Judgment, He will give me more than this. I deserve more than this. He's deluded. He has layers of delusion. He's deluded upon being deluded. But something to notice here, brothers, His wealth had entered His heart to such a level that He could not understand reality for what it was anymore. He had become completely deluded to what reality was. He started denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said. And what did His friend say in return? It's a beautiful analogy of two people. Look at the way his friend reminded him. His friend took him back to his creation. Because sometimes what happens, brothers, well, like we look in the mirror every morning and we think we've always been like this. We think we've always been like this. Six foot tall, handsome brother, mashallah. Yeah, we've just always, we've never been a baby. And we, there was never a time where we didn't even exist. His friend reminds him, he says, are you going to deny your creator, the one that created you from dust? And then from a drop of despised fluid, dirty liquid, and then shaped you into the human being you are. Well, like when you think about it, Allah says in the Quran, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِن نُطْفَةٍ But following this, فَإِذَا هُوَ خَسِيمٌ مُبِينٌ He created you from a drop of fluid, but what happens? You, start, you suddenly stand in front of God within 20 or 30 years as a challenger, as a contender. What's God done for me? Why should I worship Him? Why should I pray five times a day? Look at where you came from. You were nothing. Allah says, هَلْ أَتَعَلَى الْإِنسَانِ هِينُ مِنَ الدَّحْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٍ مَذْكُورًا Surah Insan, very first ayah, Allah starts with a question, a rhetorical question. Listen to Allah saying, wasn't there long period of time, a very long period of time, dahar, very long period, where you weren't even a thing mentioned. We refer to ourselves as I, as a person, as a self. I'm Abdullah, I'm John, I'm Steve, I'm whoever I am. Allah says there was a long period in your history, you weren't even a thing, let alone a person mentioned. What's wrong? What's deluded us? And his friend reminds him because he realizes dunya has entered his heart, but he doesn't take heed. What happens to him? What happens to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys his God. And then he's sitting there rubbing his hands, as Allah captures in the Quran, rubbing his hands and he says, only if I hadn't associated partners with my Lord. Something you guys may pick up on, but hold on a second. What idols are mentioned in these ayah? We don't hear of him associating, worshipping idols. What is he associating with Allah? It's the dunya. He gave power to the dunya. He gave power to his possessions by saying they're not going to go anywhere. The hour is not going to be established. He started to worship what he had been given. And we need to ask ourselves, are we falling into the same trap? Are we starting to worship dunya? And if we are, we need to really check ourselves and wake up. You know, shirk isn't only through worshipping in a stone or a statue somewhere. There's many forms of it and we need to be careful. We need to check ourselves from this perspective. And you know, one of the interesting things is, no matter how much you run after dunya, no matter how much you're able to amass, the one, amount, people amongst us who have wealth, that Allah's blessed with wealth, or the people amongst us who are, have desired things to buy things and they've always had the wealth and money to buy those things, ask them, ask yourself. You may have been saving for two or three years to buy that new car. When you get the car three, two or three weeks later, I will give it tops three weeks later, maybe even a couple of days later, what happens? It's just another car. And then you want something else. And then you get that something else and it's just another something else. You know. It's just another house. It's just another pay rise. We're never satisfied. That emptiness, that hole inside is not going to be fulfilled by dunya, which has been exploited by people. That's not going to be filled through running after dunya. Think about it, in the West especially, we have so much money, so much wealth, all of the basic needs of a human being are fulfilled. Food, shelter, clothing, and more, plus surplus. iPhones, iPads, cars, fridge freezers, comfortable sofas, dining tables, X, Y, and Z. We have everything. Our houses are decked out, you know, our cars, every, we have everything. Generally speaking, across the wealth, we're pro there's people that are more wealthy today. Average person is more wealthy today than elite and rich of the past. Yet, people are not happy. They are suffering from anxiety and sadness and depression because the material wealth is not going to fill that spiritual void within people. It's not going to fill it. We're a testament to that. We've experienced this ourselves. You know, if we turn away from Allah, we're not going to find anything. What does Allah say? He says, don't be like those who turn away from Allah and Allah uh, or forgot Allah and Allah made them forget themselves. You know, we don't want to fall into this trap. We were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't worship Allah, we'll end up worshiping something else. Another thing to keep in mind, 
is that as soon as a human being is born, the fact is that they are born into slavery. You cannot escape. You will be a slave and a servant to something or the other. Test it. Think about it. You will be a slave to something. Even the most staunchest of atheists, the most staunch atheist. I don't follow anything. I don't follow any system, any law, any person. I'm a free man. I do what I want to do. Look at his statement. I do what I want to do. He's a slave to himself. He follows what he wants to do. His nafs, he is sla he's a slave to his own nafs, his self, his soul. So what Islam does, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something to wake us up, brothers and sisters. Allah has given us something. He said, Look, what's Islam offering us? Choose your slavery. Are you going to be a slave to created things, worldly things, or are you going to be a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if you are a slave to Allah, if you submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, then you will be truly free. If you are a slave of Allah, you are not a slave to the dunya. You are not a slave to the material possessions of the material creation. You're free. And when you tell these people this, if you truly want freedom, you're not going to find it through running away from God. You're going to find it in God, submitting to Allah, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And not along with this, you're going to find the peace, you're going to find the tranquility, you're going to find the peace of mind and peace of heart that you're looking for. Through fulfilling the purpose of your creation, which is to worship Allah, not to worship dunya. This is why Allah created us, to worship Him. And if we're not worshipping Allah, we will be worshipping something else, or we'll never find peace and happiness. And you know something very interesting is that I believe atheism and materialism go hand in hand. Because if you look at atheism in itself, as a worldview, as an ideology, that there is no God, all that exists is the physical world, it's all an accident, YOLO, you only live once, you're only here today, you're gonna die tomorrow, do whatever you want, go and enjoy yourself, you're an accident. If you follow, this worldview has no legs to stand on. It has no legs to stand on, but then you may think, why is it still, why are people still following it if it's so weak? Why are people still following it? I really believe one of the reasons is, is because materialism and atheism go hand in hand. It's like us guys, it's like fish and chips, for example. Yeah, or halwa puri for our Pakistani brothers and uncles, yeah? It's, it's complementary. It complements each other. Why think about this? As we saw in the story of the man with the two gardens, he had the wealth. What did he do? It distracted him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It took him away from Allah. The more you're connected and you're just engrossed by material things and that materialism has entered your heart, the less space you have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where is the space for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart? This dunya will distract you. It just naturally would lead to atheism and denial. And you see this amongst youth. Oh, you know, Allah didn't give me that car that I wanted. Why should I worship Allah? Or I failed my exams. You know, why should I worship Allah? Or I wanted to marry this sister. It didn't happen. It fell through. Why should I worship Allah? You know, what has Allah done for me? It's just a silly way of thinking. It's because the dunya has become more important. We, as we think that Allah owes us something. When we, Allah should be worshipped just because of who He is. The fact that He just created us, Allah deserves worship. Just knowing that He is the most perfect being, Allah deserves worship. He owes us nothing. And oh, the reverse is true as well. As soon as you become atheistic, when you deny Allah, what does happen? It gives you a free for all reign. No, there's no accountability, there's no day of judgment, there's nothing to come. Do whatever you want. Go fulfill your desires. Go acquire material wealth. Go chase the dunya. You know, live up your, your desires. Whatever you want to do, it's all justified. So they go hand in hand. You know, it was, uh, I believe it was uh, Kierkegaard, a philosopher of the past. He said something very interesting. Normally, I don't like what philosophers say, yeah? Because most of it is just gibberish and, and they just, they go off on tangents. But he said something very interesting. He said that as soon as people deny God, boredom sets in very quickly. And then people look to satisfy themselves. They look to get a quick fix through, the, through material things, through the world. Because they're just never satisfied. They have to keep engaging themselves because there's just a sense of boredom that has just entered their heart. But those that have God, that believe in God, they are always in a state of you know, this internal excitement because you can never encapsulate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, you can never get enough of Allah. You always want to get closer to Allah. You always want to learn more about Allah and you can never encapsulate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's true. And it's very true what he said. So it's, it's something that we need to keep in mind, brothers and sisters. We need to ask ourselves, where do we stand? You know, and if we are ingrained in this system, we need to wake up. Because Islam came to wake us up. Islam came to set the record straight. And Islam is the final way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose till the end of times, till the day of judgment. It's a perfect system. It's the perfect way of life. And it's as relevant today as it was 40, over 1400 years ago. And just as a few things to keep in mind now, a few things as far as from a positive perspective. Now, how do we deal with this dunya and navigate this dunya? How do we navigate this world that we're living in with all of its trials and its fitness? How do we deal with this? If we go back to Surah Al-Kahf, I believe the answers are in all of the stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares. Now, there's a few lessons that we can take. Now, when I'm giving my tadabbur and my reflection upon these stories, don't think that this is the only lessons to be learned from these, these stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares. The, the lessons are numerous. But if you look at these, reflect upon these stories with the lenses of the subject that we're dealing with today, you will see some very amazing insights. Let's start with the first story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares, which is the story of the people of the cave. Very interesting story. 
there's a group of young people, again, youth, youngsters, those that are really tested by the dunya, by the world around them. They live amongst a society where they're worshipping idols, they're worshipping other gods and deities and so on and so forth, right? What do they do? They stand up in front of this tyrant, their tyrant ruler who's getting people to worship these idols and they, clar they declare that they worship Allah alone. And what do they do after they do this? They leave the dunya and they go into the cave. Young people, they leave the dunya, the material world, all the material luxuries and they go into the cave for the sake of Allah alone. What does Allah do in return for them? These ain't prophets, these are, these are just youth. Not different from any of us here today. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do for them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them out of that time and space. 300 years or 309 years depending on which calendar you look at. 300 years into the future. SubhanAllah. Allah changes the laws of physics, the laws of reality for these people that stood up for the truth. One lesson we could take from these brothers and sisters is when it comes between choosing between dunya and standing up for the truth, always stand up for the truth. Give up the dunya. Give it up for the sake of Allah and Allah will replace it with something far greater. And have no doubt in this. Allah will definitely replace it with something better. Never doubt that for a second. Second lesson we learn. Go to the story of Dhulkarnayn right at the end. Here's the opposite now. Dhulkarnayn is a man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessed with immense wealth, immense power, immense rulership over lands. What does he do? Does he just say, you know what, I'm going to throw this dunya away, I'm going to go into a cave and just worship Allah and become a monk? No. What does he do? He uses the power and the wealth that Allah has given him and he uses it in the path of Allah. He travels the earth, he helps people, he takes care of people. He actually stands up as a vice as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when he addresses the angels. He fulfills those shoes, he fulfills that role. He helps people and when for example he puts up the barrier, when he puts up the, the, the barrier, what does he say? This is from the mercy of Allah. He always ties everything back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He acknowledges Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He acknowledges the fact that Allah is the one that gave him power. Allah is the one that gave him the wealth. Allah is the one that gave him the money, the wealth and everything that he had. And he acknowledges Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So lesson to be learned from this brothers and sisters, at least one lesson is, if you have wealth, if you've been blessed with money, if you've been blessed with power, then use it for the sake of Allah. Spend it in the path of Allah. This is a means for you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gain reward. Let's go to another story of Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. Beautiful story, Musa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to accompany Khidr. Because Khidr has been given certain knowledge that Musa alayhi salam doesn't have. So as he accompanies him, Khidr points out to him that you're not going to be able to be patient with me. I'm going to do things, you're not going to like them and you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to be patient. So what does he do? He goes with him, he accompanies him, they go on a journey. Khidr does a few things. For example, he makes a hole in the boat of a poor fisherman, you know, and Musa alayhi salam jumps at these things. He's like, why are you doing this? You know, you're, you're just, just destroying the property of some poor person and his livelihood. And he does a few things and Musa alayhi salam can't understand and he jumps the gun and he asks him, why are you doing this? And then at the end of their journey together, Khidr lets him in on the reasons behind the things that he did. He, he lets him into the wisdoms behind the reasons, the reasons behind the things that he did. Certain things that, that Musa alayhi salam didn't know at the time. And then things fall into perspective. Okay, now I understand what you did these things. But a lesson we can learn from this is when it comes to this dunya and the way things happen in this life, have patience. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows best and He wants best for all of us. He wants best for all of us. If we understand this brothers and sisters, whatever happens in our life, even if you don't understand it, even if it seems unfair or just you can't make sense of it, put your trust in Allah, be patient. Don't jump the gun, right? And, and I really encourage you brothers and sisters to just reflect over Surah Al-Kahf. It, it will, you will find insights and we know the Prophet وسلم, in relation to this particular surah, he gave us some very interesting insights. He told us to one, recite this every Friday, right? And he also told us that this was a protection, at least memorizing the first 10 ayat and the last 10 against the fitna of the jah. Right? He made this clear, he told us this. Now, when I was preparing for this talk, you know, I, I did some research into the word Dajjal itself. Dajjal it comes from that root. It was very interesting is that the word doesn't only mean a deceiver or someone that deceives, but it also means to cover up something. For example, the examples are given when you get tar and you cover up a camel with this black pitch. Or when you have metal and you gild the metal. You know when you put a get gold leaf and you gild metal with gold and you cover it? That also comes from the same root. And it's interesting when you look at the reality of this dunya that we live in, all the glitz and glamour and the way the shaitan is making it alluring to us. He's beautifying this. You know, he's beautifying this for us. So this surah is a very powerful protection from the trials of this dunya. You know, whether you see it as the system that's been put into place before the arrival of the job, it, whatever way you see it, the fact is that this dunya is distracting us and de deceiving us and deluding us from our Creator. It's taking us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It's a world of deception. And the only way we can truly protect ourselves in this time, brothers and sisters, is if we were to hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. We've let go of the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah being the Quran, His final revelation, which is preserved. Well, like brothers, we don't think about this. You know, as human beings, and I'll end on this point, as human beings, when we understand the value of something, of a system, of a thing, whatever it is, we try to maximize the benefit from it, right? We'll maximize the benefit from it. But something has distracted us from the reality that we have the final revelation of the creator of the heavens and the earth, which has been preserved to the word, to the letter, unchanged for over 1400 years. For who? For us. SubhanAllah, when you think about it, it's crazy. There's people that are spending millions and billions of dollars and pounds on trying to set up these, these radio telescopes, trying to receive a signal from outer space, from extraterrestrial life forms, right? So millions are being spent. We have a message, not from another civilization or another creature from somewhere out in the universe. We have revelation from the creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His words, right among, amidst us, in our hands, in our hands. What are we doing with it? If we really understood the value of the Quran, we wouldn't put it down. We wouldn't have time to put it down. We wouldn't have time to put it down. And it's for us. Allah, Allah is free of need, free of one. He's not going to benefit from us picking up the Quran and reading it. We're going to benefit from it. We will protect ourselves. We will make the most of this life. It will protect us from the, the fitting and the trials of this dunya. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, you don't have to buy what I say. Keep, if the dunya is what you're worried about, if the worldly life is what you're concerned about, and chasing it, carry on doing it. Even if you attain it, what's going to happen at the end of the day? You're going to enter your grave. You're going to be buried. You're going to die. This is a fact no atheist on the face of this planet would be either deny. Every single human being is going to die without a shadow of a doubt. A universal fact, no doubt in it. When you die, what are you going to take with you? What are you going to take with you? Even if they stuff all the money and wealth you gain into your mouth and put it in your coffin, what's that going to do for you? It's not going to go with you, brothers and sisters. Anything in this dunya is not going to go with you. The only thing that's going to return with you is the deeds that you do, the actions that you do, your sincerity behind the actions that you do for the sake of Allah. That's what matters. Utilize this dunya in helping us and aiding us in worshiping our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we need to focus on, brothers and sisters.